Well, John Moses Browning got his interest in guns from his father, Jonathan. He himself was quite a gun maker. He made some guns, he even made the barrels for the guns, which very few people knew how to do in those days. And uh, John Moses and his brother Matt loved to hunt, and so they got interested in guns early, and John made Matt a gun when he was about eight or nine years old, because Matt didn't have one. By the time he was 14, 15 years old, his school teacher told him, you don't have to come to school anymore, John. You know as much as I do. So that was the end of his schooling. I think he had a, uh, a really good three-dimensional way of thinking. He could solve problems in three dimensions. He could see all of the things that had to come together. His first gun was a single shot. Uh, and it was invented in 1878, and it was invented because John Moses Browning didn't like the guns that were already on the market, and he thought he could design one that was better, and indeed, it was. John Browning's single-shot rifle came to the attention of the Winchester Repeating Firearms Company, and the vice president and general manager of Winchester, T.G. Bennett, literally hopped a train to Ogden, Utah, which of course was right on a rail line, and, and met with John Moses Browning, and they wanted to buy the rights to this gun, to buy, buy the patent. Most gun makers, it's usually if one man up there designs a gun, it takes several years before the gun is actually put into production and used. Where John M. would take a gun and design the gun and have it on the market in 60, 80 days. A good example of that is the 86 Winchester. Bennett, the vice president of Winchester wanted that one badly. He bought the patent on it. And he said, this shoots, shoots nothing but large ammunition. We need one similar to it that shoots lighter ammunition. He says, how long can we expect to have that? He says, well, I would think probably in 90 days or so. And he says, in 90 days, he said, well, if I can't do it in a short of time, I'll do it for nothing. That's just an expression of how quick he could get other guns on the market. John M., I think, and M.S. Browning, who was actually the business part of the thing, decided that they wanted to get royalties off of the guns rather than just sell the patents. But Winchester was not willing to do that. I think that's one way that Browning the man was somewhat visionary in the sense of his business dealings. He wanted to sell guns and he really you know didn't have a huge uh, sense of having to be exclusive to any one manufacturer. He wanted to sell his designs and wanted to get compensated for that. So he formed a partnership with Fabrique Nationale out of Belgium and made many, many, many transatlantic crossings during the course of, of that relationship. And that spawned uh, production of these guns in uh, today in, in Belgium, in uh, Portugal, and in many cases the Browning uh, commercial designs that have uh, been mainstays of the company that John Browning founded uh, at that time are produced by Moroku of Japan. John Browning left a legacy that reached far beyond Ogden, Utah. He left a legacy that spanned the globe. It's difficult to say what was one of the most important designs. It's like asking which of your children do you love best. Obviously the 92, 94 Winchester rifles were uh, really primary things. But some of the other things were the, obviously the machine guns, the early Colt machine guns, and things. I, obviously the 
the 50 caliber machine gun is still being manufactured and used today very extensively. I, I, I had heard that uh, one of the things that he felt he was most proud of was the Colt 1902 pistol that uh, was the forerunner of the uh, 1911 45 pistol. It's a very, very elegant, simple uh, design that uh, essentially dictated the way that all modern semi-automatic pistols are made. John Browning's legacy can't be under uh, underestimated. With over 125 design patents, he was uh, the father of sporting and military uh, firearms designed for the 19th and 20th century. Uh, firearms that are still being manufactured today by, by SIG, by Smith & Wesson, by HK. Uh, all can trace uh, little hints and influences from John Browning's myriad of firearms innovations and design. It's truly appropriate to call John Browning and a genius in this case with the same level of elevation that we, we talk about Albert Einstein in the, in the same terms. Most people don't realize that when John Browning was here, um, I, you know, he really didn't have a company per se. He was the engineer, the designer. And we really didn't form a company at the, the Browning Arms Company until after his death, actually. It was about a year afterwards that the family uh, kind of created an actual company uh, around the name and started to brand Browning as a brand and as a company to build guns under that name. Everything prior to that had really been as, uh, as design and, and um, innovative and engineering type capabilities. So that was around uh, the 1927 or so era um, when they actually kind of formed a Browning Arms Company. One of the really cool pieces about our company is that we have kept John Browning's designs relevant in today's day and age, and some direct pieces of it um, still still in the line. Um, Obviously, the, the superpose that has turned into the, the Satori is, is a main piece of that. The revision of the A5 is back. Um, different in design, but still an element of, of what that is. Um, you also have products like the BAR. Again, that was one of those that was a military grade, refined into a sporting arms. We still have today, so it's still the same principles of, of his design. Um, a modification of the 1911 um, as part of our line today in the 22 and the 380 um, design. The SA-22, which was an exact um, bill from, from John Browning, is still in line today as, as an automatic 22. Um, we also still have the high power in the line, which was one of his last designs that he did uh, from the pistol side of things. Um, it's slightly revised from what he had had originally, but that's still through the line and through the lineage. And so you look at our catalog today and there are still a pile of products that uh, really have a direct line to either his original designs or at least his original concepts of his designs that are still living in our catalog today. One of the unique pieces that uh, really makes Browning what it is today um, is bolt action rifles, which John Browning didn't have a huge legacy in, um, but today is, is a big piece of our puzzle. So when we introduced uh, the A-Bolt um, back nearly 30 some odd years ago now, and now the X-Bolt, um, it's becoming a legacy product for the company as well. You know, it's easy for a company like us to rest upon our laurels. I mean, it's easy to rest upon tradition and history. Um, right now, that is not what our focus is. Today, our focus is really heavily on uh, innovation and new and exciting products that are coming out uh, that are in the works right now. And so it's it very John M. Browning-esque right now. We're new and innovative and out of the box thought processes are, are flowing through here. And so I think you can see coming forward in um, the next couple of years, some, some pretty cool things coming out of Browning that are not just uh, the, the standard old uh, historic or traditional type look of, of products.